difficult for you guys to tell the difference between the two stands, but this is the uh, pastor stand, and that's the music stand, so had to make sure to get those in order. Good morning. Oh, come on. Now, that was, that was very weak. Very, very weak. Good morning. Good morning. Super. That's what we're looking for. No sleepers here today. No sleepers. Um, so I'll ask you a question as we begin. Um, how many of you, I had the opportunity yesterday, as you know, I love to mow. How many of you had the opportunity to mow yesterday? Okay, I just got to tell you, yesterday was the perfect day to mow. Not only was the weather so nice, but when you get a rain like that following right up after it, as someone who grades yards for a living, I just loved uh, yesterday, not only getting to uh, mow, but it's nice, as, as you know, it's nice and quiet in my world um, when, uh, when I'm out mowing. And so I had a great time yesterday, and I get to enjoy that with Carson. It's heaven to Carson as well, right, buddy? Sure. <laughs> Whatever you say, Dad. That's why I put him on the spot here on uh, Sunday morning. But no, I had a great time uh, this weekend. I hope uh, you did as well. No matter uh, what you faced this week, again, whether you thought yesterday was great or not so great, I hope it's been a good weekend, a great week uh, as well. A couple things just that are on my heart to uh, bring your attention to uh, before we begin. Uh, one is uh, Titus and Alicia Hofer, I believe, are here. Where are they at? Stand up just a moment. There are our missionaries uh, working with 7-9, and uh, connect with them after the service if you have the opportunity. And uh, it's nice to have you here this morning. Um, also, it was mentioned about the homeless shelter. We work with our, the Harvey County Homeless Shelter over there in, in Newton. This is our month coming up in October, and uh, I've been told the meals have been taken care of. So if, if in the past you've helped out with signing up to, for taking a meal over there, I believe those are all covered. However, there are um, positions as far as covering for volunteers uh, through the evening and perhaps even into the night that are, that are still open. So make sure you stop by there and uh, there's a sign-up sheet right as, as you go into the foyer. All right, uh, this morning... We're not in the book of John. Actually, we're going to be at a variety of places uh, within Scripture. And so if you have your bulletin, I just invite you to take that out. Uh, I'll be listing the Scriptures that we're using as we go along. But there's an opportunity there to to see where we're going. Plus, if if you don't have a Bible, um, the uh, page numbers for which Scriptures we're looking at correspond with the Bibles that are there in your row, the blue Bibles in your row. So you could take one of those out and follow along. Uh, if you would like. Let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, as we begin. Dearly Father, I, I thank you. Thank you for the, for the beautiful day, for the sunshine this morning. And uh, Heavenly Father, as we're gathered here as, as a group of followers of you, we again submit to you, we look into your word, and we ask that, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through it. Uh, thankful for the fact that we're not alone in this world, that you're here with us, you've provided a helper, you've provided us with help as we go through life. And uh, Lord, some days uh, we feel like we're on top of the world, and other times uh, we wonder what that feeling feels like. And so, uh, Lord, wherever we come, however it is that uh, wherever our hearts are, again, we, we want to be focused on you, and we want to allow your spirit to, call, uh, to, to speak to us. Uh, may we not be distracted by either anything around us or whatever maybe is going on in our mind, uh, responsibilities we have, trouble that we face. Uh, may we see you in the midst of, of life and the... And the uh, just the relationship we can have with your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we ask it all in, in his name. Amen. Tomorrow, I am headed to Kansas City, and I have the opportunity to be a part of a, a vision conference that our Mennonite brethren are, are holding. And I'm actually traveling with Bruce, 
Bruce Eitzen and I are going to be, be traveling up there. We're going to be meeting together with about, I think it's about 50, 60 different leaders, individuals from across the United States uh, and looking at uh, who is the next, not only who is the next leader of, of the Mennonite Brethren and, and the conference in general, but more specifically, what is our vision and where is it that we're going? And as an assignment, as we prepared to go, uh, we were given this, this little book to read. And uh, on the, it's entitled Good to Great and the Social Sector. Now, you might have heard of the book Good to Great, Okay? Not a necessarily religious book. It's written by Jim Collins. And uh, the intention of Good to Great, and I haven't read that book. I've just read this one. So, yes, have you read yours yet, Bruce? Okay, good. Um, just checking up, and nobody needs to know. Yeah, you're lucky. Um, good to Great is all about how businesses going, go from being good to being great. And specifically with, with this pamphlet that Jim Collins is putting together, he's saying, now we've looked at what it means to be great or maybe just to be good in the business sector. What does it look like from, a, from the social side? And, and individuals continue to ask him whether you're a, a, maybe a hos- hospital or a school, uh, a nonprofit, a church, what does it really look like to be great? What does it look like to be great? In business, being great, you can probably tie specifically back to the idea we're successful if in the end we have money, right? The more money you have, the idea in business is the more successful you are being. Now in, these, in the social sector, in the nonprofits, or even here on a Sunday morning, if we talk about what it means to be successful, is being successful what we just did? That is taking the offering. Is it about money? So do we go back there and we have the ushers count the offering and say, man, this morning we had a successful service because look at all this money that was given. Or perhaps, boy, this wasn't a very successful morning. Nobody gave. No, success isn't found in necessarily how much is given on a Sunday morning in an offering or throughout the week. Although, does it impact who we are and what we can do? Without a doubt. So finances play a part in the social sector, but it's not the driving force of whether or not we're successful or not. If you talk to the business types, which Jim Collins has done, the business types would say, if you're going to be great as a, as a so, in the social sector, you need to be more like a business. Okay? And maybe you've heard that before, that you know, in the social sector, maybe your hospital or a church, you need to start incorporating more business-like procedures. Because if you do that, you're going to improve and you're going to be great. But what Jim says is, why would we do that when most businesses aren't great? He would argue most businesses are simply good. Why would we ask or encourage the social sector? Why would we encourage a church to be more like a business in order to be great when most businesses are only good? Because greatness isn't a business concept. Okay, Greatness isn't a business concept. Greatness comes, Jim would argue, from being disciplined. Now that word we talk about, disciplines, Recently, we went through the book uh, on uh, what it means to be authentic. And in it, there were the, the six disciplines of the Christian faith. And being disciplined leads us to greatness, Jim would say, whether it's in the business sector or in the social sector. I don't know that I've told you this before, so I want to go on record. I believe the video camera's on. The, it's recording. As a leader here at this church, as a pastor for you, as pastors, we like being good, but we don't want to be just good. We want to be great. Do you want to be great? Do you want to see this church be great? Being good is all right, and, and for the most part, I, that's where I think that we are, but I want to be great. And so as I read through this, and as I was preparing for tomorrow, thinking about stewardship, thinking about who we are as a church and where we're, where we're going, I had to step back as well and say, 
Where are you, Bran? Where is s and Church? Are we good? Are we great? And where are we headed? And where are we headed? If you look on the, the front of your bulletin, and uh, I know you're probably all taking notes, so just take that, uh, your note-taking sheet and open it up to the front. And uh, there on the front, it has what we define as success. Our, our goal is to be making disciples who make disciples. So as we think about greatness, part of how we define that is in the making of disciples. We want to be making disciples who make disciples. You've heard us talk about discipleship over and over again here in this past year. So as we do that, then my question is, if we're going to be great, if we're moving towards greatness and want to continue to being great, what will be the things that we're doing? Well, priority number one, and we're going to be looking at this in particular throughout this morning as we think about stewardship. Priority number one in being great is worship. Priority number one in being great is worship. Success in making disciples, first and foremost, happens through worship. Happens through worship. If, you're, if you have that outline, I just, I'll just i get it over with already. Uh, there's blanks to fill in, right? If kids in particular, if you're filling out the outline, there's some blanks to fill in. They're all worship, okay? You don't have to listen. Well, please listen the rest of the time. But fill in those blanks already. They're all worship because that's where we're headed this morning. And we're going to start by looking at what Jesus gave us as examples. The first one comes in, in John chapter 12 and verse 8, the first example that we have. And we read about this just a couple of weeks ago as we were looking at uh, the book of John and going, and going through these passages. And, and the first one comes from when, when Jesus was there in the house of, uh, Simi, of Simon the leper, and uh, Mary came, and she poured the perfume on Jesus. How much was that perfume worth? It was worth a year's wages. And what is the average in in Harvey County? Anybody remember what we used as an example? Yes, Travis. What? 50,000. So in our day and age, she took $50,000 worth of perfume and poured it out on Jesus. And they were all like, what? $50,000 poured out on on him. To which Judas replied, what is she doing? There's a lot better ways to use $50,000 than to pour it onto uh, Jesus' head. Pour it onto his feet and clean his feet. John 12, verse 8. Jesus replied, I'm going to start with verse 7 because that's the best, well, not the best part, but a part of it. He says, leave her alone. You know, quit bothering Mary. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. Now, verse 8. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Judas says, we should be spending that $50,000 on the poor. Jesus says, leave her alone. What's the one thing that's more important than the poor? Worshiping him. Worshiping him. Number one priority. Example number two. You can turn there if you would like. Hopefully you have this memorized out of Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus is speaking with the Pharisees. Pharisees want to challenge Jesus to trap him. And in Matthew 22, and I'm starting in verse 35, it says one of them, that is one of the Pharisees, an expert in the law, he was a lawyer, he tested him with this question, teacher, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? They had all these laws. They thought if he can have to pick out one of those, we can trap him. We can make him look bad. We can undermine his ministry. To which Jesus replied in verse 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Best $50, not $50,000, but best $50 I think I've spent on my car is I I got the, and we could argue about this, but I got that uh, license plate, and if you notice it says 2237. Why did I do that? It gives me the opportunity when people ask me, why does your license plate say 2237 on the back to say, you know, I don't always reach this goal, but my goal for myself, the goal for our church, is to love God God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. It's our number one priority. That's why we're here. 
That's in case you wondered why I have a personalized license plate that says 2237 on. That's why I put it on there. Because wherever I go, and when I'm driving and people are cutting me off and I'm thinking all these things and want to respond to the circumstances around me, I also know that I'm being a testimony. I'm saying I want to love Jesus, and yet I'm acting like that. I'm put on the spot every time. That's okay. That's what our goal is. That's what our goal. And that's the example that Jesus gives to us as we think about our number one priority. 50, 000, whether it's $50,000 for the perfume or when we look at all of the commandments that the, that the Jews had in the, in the Old Testament, the greatest thing is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Great disciples are worshiping disciples. Great disciples are worshiping disciples. Now, do any of you have junior high kids? If you have junior high kids, you're going to know exactly what I'm talk, going into next. Because, you know, when our children, which are, are beautiful children, are born, they're the most beautiful child in the whole wide world, and they obey everything that you say till about the age of nine. And then, well, and maybe they don't obey all the time, but um, up until the age of nine, they might disobey, right? But that's kind of the, all that they're doing, is they're either obeying or disobeying, because you're the parents, and they do, for the most part, what you ask them to do. All of a sudden, about the age of between 10 and 14, and I need to talk to you, Ben, at some point about this, because it seems like, you know, when they walk in for fifth grade, and then kind of on forward, uh, they start asking that question, yeah, but why? Right? So it, it's not just good enough that as parents we give direction to our kids at that age. From like 10 on, it's, there's got to be a, a good reason, though. We, we just don't do this because, because that's what mom and dad say. We, we have to know why we're doing what mom and dad says. And so as we're looking at worship being priority number one, the question that the, I know you're not asking, but the junior hires might be asking that are here this morning. Yeah, Brad, but why? Why is worship, why is worship number one? Well, worship is number one, and I'll put this maybe in terms that, that you as parents might use with your junior hires, first of all. Okay, in, in your outline it says, it says so in his word, but we're going to say because he said so, Okay. Worship is number one because Jesus said so. I mean, if he's saying it's all right to spend $50,000 on perfume to pour it on his feet and wash his feet, then it's okay. okay? He's, Jesus has said he is to be number one. Another passage that, that brings this out besides uh, John chapter 12 and verse, and we were in John 12 verse 8. Uh, instead, now I'm going to take you to Colossians. Uh, turn to Colossians is that the right one? First Corinthians, my apologies. We'll go to First Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and verse 31. In First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, it says, "So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God." That isn't Jesus speaking there. That's Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He says, it doesn't matter if you're eating or drinking, things that are basic for life, and then it says, or whatever you do, which then lumps in everything else that we have as a part of that. He says, whatever it is that you're doing, you do it as worship. Our life is called to be worship. How do we do that? We do that through what our attitude is. Just like we can be here this morning, and we can be here, maybe mom and dad told you to be here. Maybe you have other alternative reasons for being here on Sunday morning, okay? Jesus says how we live our lives, the attitude as we live our life out, whether it's showing up on a Sunday morning or going to work tomorrow morning, we can do that as worship. Worship is not just defined as the songs that we sing. Okay? Well, a lot of times when we say worship, right away the first thing that comes to our minds is, well, it's the songs that we sing. No, that's part of it. And it's part of what we do corporately on a Sunday morning, but that's not the only worship. Eating, drinking, or whatever we do can be to his glory through our attitude. Second reason why it's number one, why worship should be the number one priority. Again, parents, you might 
use this phrase from time to time, and that is, uh, you might say to your children, oh, I brought you into this world, right? And I can take you out. Okay, scripture doesn't exactly say that, but he's the one that created us, isn't he? He's the one that created us. If you look at uh, one of the passages that I'm going to use is uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. You might know this having uh, memorized it growing up. It says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. People disagree on what that looks like, but Genesis 1.1 says that God did it. Genesis 1.1 says that God created the heavens and the earth. It goes on to explain all the things that, excuse me, all the things that he created. And by the way, he gives you an opportunity to create as well, doesn't he? Okay. As parents, if you have children, you've been a part of the creation process. Women more than men, I must say. So guys, before you start thinking, hey, uh, I've had a lot to do with the creation process, you've had a little bit to do with the creation process, but your wife has had most to do with the creation process, right? Carrying that child, bringing him or her into this world. God created us. There's something about the fact when, when you make something, when you've created that, that you have the authority then to tell it what to do or define how it's going to be used. We do that naturally with our children. God created you. He has instructions for you. But not just that. And if you're in the Go Deeper class with uh, Pastor JL, you're studying the, the book of Colossians. And I, I've, um, that's a passage I want to use as well in this idea of he created us. If you turn to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, it says this, speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. Everything. Not only created by him, but they exist through him and for him. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. It says that he is the beginning and end of everything. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I started out by telling you he brought you into the world and he can take you out. These last two verses say he's shown you grace because I know you've sinned. I know that I've sinned. And yet, I'm still here. I'm still here. It says that he made peace with us, that he stepped out, he sent his son, the same one who created it, to come and be the solution. Not only is he the creator, he is also the savior. His grace is what we experience each and every day when we live rather than paying the price for our sin, what we deserve. Great disciples are worshiping disciples. So our number one priority is worship. I've told you why it's number one. And thirdly, lastly, where is it then that we are called to worship? Well, the first place that we're going to look at is in the temple. Again, let's go to 1 Corinthians. This time, chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's talking about where worship takes place. You see, in the Old Testament, God had given instructions to the Jews to build a temple. And, and in, when they first started, it was, it was a movable one. They were leaving and going from Egypt to the Promised Land up in Israel, in what would be Israel. And so the temple was, was a building that you could take down and, and take with them and move on. Once they got to the promised land and they established Jerusalem, they built the temple, the building. 
In the New Testament, though, we see that, that the Holy Spirit was given as a gift. And, and in verses 18 through 20, it talks a little bit more about what it looks like to have the Holy Spirit live inside of you. Look at verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Verse 19, and this is, again, going back to who we are in Christ. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. While the temple was moved around and while it was that the Holy Spirit, God, existed in that temple in the Old Testament, it says here in the New Testament, when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. You're a temple. Wherever you go, the Holy Spirit goes with you. And specifically, it says here, and this is why it, when we talk about sexual immorality, it, it's very personal, it says here, right? It says every other sin that you commit is outside your body, but sexual immorality goes to the soul. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And, and this verse here really goes, is what's describing what we, what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I'll read that for you again. Verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What makes that possible? This verse right there in, in verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Everything that you say and everything that you do, what you eat, what you drink, wherever you go, you could do it all for the glory of God because the Holy Spirit lives within you. He guides you. He provides for you. I could be stealing, gossiping, having sexual immorality, but I don't. Not because I'm so good, but because I love Jesus. I've submitted my life to him. Now he lives within me. And as I listen and follow after him, the things, the things that I do, I normally wouldn't do. Let's be honest. If I was doing what I wanted to do, I wouldn't always be doing the things that I do now because the things that I want to do aren't always the things that God's called me to do. But the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. We're called to follow after him. Our bodies are a temple. We're not our own. We've been purchased. I can't be the same if he lives inside of me. There's going to be a change. Not only is it our bodies, but it's also the building, this place, this sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and following, it says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is Jesus' body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. These next uh, three verses, uh, I love them because they got great words within them. So we'll go back and look at these last three verses uh, more specifically. Verse 23, this is for all you race car fans, first of all. There's a theme in these, in these verses. Okay, race car fans, pay attention. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess that he who promised is faithful. As you're driving that car, right, unswervingly, what does it mean to follow after Jesus? When you're first driving, maybe, again, going back to junior high, right, eighth grader, when you turn that wheel, do you turn it just a little bit, or do you feel like you've got to turn it a lot? Man, I tell you what, you're going all over the road, because it feels like when you're just learning to drive that you're going to have to turn that wheel a lot in order to get it to go where you want it to do. But as you get older, and as you drive more, what do you learn? It's not big adjustments that you're making. It's, you're going down the interstate at 80 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour in a 75. Um, yeah, not, not 75 in a 55. Don't get that wrong. Um, but you don't have to turn that wheel very much, right? To, but yet, if you don't turn it, you, you are going off the road. 
You have to continue to make adjustments. It says, hold on unswervingly to what God has called us to. All right, verse, verse 24, this is for the cowboys. Not cowboy in football, but as in the real cowboys that ride the horses out there. Verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, right? I only know really, well, there might be other cowboys or cowgirls in the audience here this morning. My father-in-law is a, is a cowboy. He just got back from, is it 17 miles, Sal? How many? Oh, 17 days. He went on a, on a covered wagon uh, train, trail. He has a covered wagon. He had the horses. They were going across the prairies of South Dakota. Um, the pic, one of the pictures we got, they were driving right on the road. I'm like, that... Lewis and Clark didn't have roads like that, but anyways, he's going to be here in a couple weeks, so I've got to be good. Um, but this is one of his verses that, that we're called to spur one another on, what cowboys wear, right? They got the spurs on, their boots, they use those to encourage the horses to go where they're, they're supposed to go to move along, to keep going, because we want to stop, we want to give up, we want to stop and smell the roses, and yet we need encouragement. A little bit of spurring on as we go. Verse 25, why is that? Why is that? Why do we, why do we need to, to hold on unswervingly? Why do we need to spur one another? Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We are called to meet together within this sanctuary with God. Again, I, I hope that you see him here this morning. That's our goal, is to be worshiping him. He's here with us. Not giving up. We get tired. We get busy. God says, you need to gather together. You need each other. All those other people with the Holy Spirit living inside of them, you need to be around them to encourage one another. Because life tomorrow, life when you walk out the doors yet this morning is tough. We're not only tired and busy, but we're also tempted to say, I can do it on my own. And he says, no, you can't. Not only do you need the Holy Spirit, you need each other. I've made you to depend on one another. Great disciples are worshiping disciples. Now, I know you're saying to yourself, Brad, I thought you said this sermon was going to be on, on stewardship. And a lot of times when we think about stewardship, we think about, well, he's just going to talk about money and how we're supposed to spend our money. Did I or, or not? As we're thinking about what worship is, I, I would argue it's all about stewardship. You see, stewardship is, is managing what God has given, given us. Stewardship is, is looking at the, the time that we have, your life, the treasure that you have, the, the money, the resources, your house, your car, whatever it is that you have as far as tangible items, the talent that you have, your skills, uh, that's just so that the kids knew what I was talking about. Uh, you, your giftedness, your talents, all of, all of those things that, that you have, God's, God's given them to you. And he said to me, we'll use me as the example, here you go, Brad. I, I'm giving you life. I'm giving you time. I'm giving you resources. I'm giving you these skills. Wow, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. What am I going to do? What am I going to do with these things that he's given me? Not a penny, not a minute, not a skill that you have doesn't come from God. Every minute, every penny, any skill is from God, and it's been given to you to manage. What is worship if not managing that time, treasure, and talent that he has given to you? You see, you can't worship without serving, and time, treasure, and talent will show what it is that you worship, because you're serving it. You're serving it. How you're spending those things, that's what you're worshiping. That's what you're serving. He has given you time, money, resources, gifts, talents, and relationships. Worship is taking all it is that he's given me and coming back to him and saying, how do you want me to use it? I give it back to you. It's your time. It's your money. These are your skills that you've given me. Show, me. show me what you want me to do with these things. 
as we close this morning, um, we normally sing a song together. But as, as, I, was, um, as I was preparing for this morning, uh, one of the songs that kept going through my mind was the song, My Redeemer Lives. Uh, and I invited Nicole C. Mullen to be here this morning, but I was too short to notice, so we had to go plan B, which is uh, the video. And so um, we're going we're gonna to be playing that video of the song, My Redeemer Lives. And um, at the end of each service, we have our, our prayer teams that will be up here in the front, and we invite you to come and pray with them. If you have things that are on your heart, we didn't have our normal sharing time this morning. If there's something that, that you're carrying, a burden that you're carrying, or a praise item that you have, and you'd like to pray with someone, please come and up here to the front, and our, our, our prayer teams uh, will be there. But also, I, I would just want to remind you that, that Jesus lives. Okay? We don't serve. We don't worship. Uh, someone who's dead and still in the grave. Uh, if you've been hurt, broken, disappointed, or rejected, specifically even this week, uh, God calls you to, to turn around and, and continue to worship him. Not only is it the least that we could do, it's also the greatest thing that you could do.